This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is September 27th, and it's just me, producer Pat. We'll be back with a regular panel show next week, but we have an interview for you today. If you're a regular listener, you'll remember that back in June, we spoke with frequent TRC contributor Dr. Stuart Faramond. Stu is a medical doctor turned science communicator, author, and food science expert. He's been on the show a bunch of times to talk to us about all sorts of food science-related things, but this interview back in June was different. We spoke with him two days before he underwent brain surgery for a tumor. Several people wrote in to wish Stuart well and to thank him for being so open about his story. Well, today we catch up with Stu. We talk about how his surgery went, his ongoing treatment, he gives us some tidbits from his upcoming book, and we even get into a couple of food science questions. A bit of an update. Since we recorded this interview, Stuart has finished his radiotherapy and says he's really happy to finally be home doing normal things like walking the dog. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this follow-up conversation with Dr. Stuart Faramond. I'm very happy to say welcome back to The Reality Check, Dr. Stuart Faramond. Thanks ever so much for having me on again. It's a pleasure to speak with you once more. Minus hair and a bit of brain. Yes, yeah. I was just saying uh, off the air that uh, you're looking very punk rock. Yes, Um I'm a bit scary. Got the got the facial hair and no hair on my head and a big scar across my skull. So yes. Right. Aww. So maybe we should explain. The last time uh, we spoke to you, Stuart, you were two days before going in for brain surgery. How did things go? Yes, it was for a um, malignant glioma, which is a type of brain cancer that had been that was diagnosed about twelve years ago. Been very slowly growing, and over the last few years, uh, it has been growing faster and it has been expanding. And so it was it was opportunity to go in there and to take out that brain tumor, which all went well. They said the operation went well, but when I woke up, um, I couldn't move my left hand at all. And it took me a long time to kind of become, I guess, with it back in the, back in the real world. Um, but yes, yeah, so all went well. They, there is still a bit in there. And so I'm having radiotherapy and chemotherapy now in an attempt to try and destroy as much of that final bit as possible to give me um, the best possible outcome and hopefully long life. I was going to ask, what is that little bit? It's just because it would have been too risky to take that out as well? or Yeah, the, the tumour has just started to go into uh, what's called the corpus callosum in the brain. And that's this thick white band of tissue that connects the left and the right side of the brain together. And all the connections between the two halves of the brain go through this, this thick tract. And the danger is, is that if you cut into that, you can cause no end of problems. So they've kind of, they've left that little bit in there with a view to, we're hoping the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. The radiotherapy is essentially high powered x-rays that are, that are shaped and targeted to just to target that little bit. Uh, and the chemotherapy, which are tablets that I'm having at the moment. Oh, you're doing both radio and chemotherapy at the same time? Yeah, so? both at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm going to go and just have chemotherapy cycles. Essentially, chemotherapy is a poison to both you and cancer cells, but it kills cancer cells faster than it kills people. So the whole idea is to try and get as high a dose in you as possible that kills the cancer without killing you. Um, so that's so it's, it's kind of like really crude. Um, in the future, we're going to have more targeted therapies and these immunotherapies that use your own your body's own immune system to kill cancers. But at the moment, it's pretty much the best thing that we've got. And are you having side effects from those treatments? I had really bad nausea to begin with with the chemotherapy. Um, so it's just like I guess it's like morning sickness all the time. Um, it's just horrible. I've kind of got on top of that now, so that's a lot better. And I guess hair falling out, that was really distressing. Just one day I was sat down working on, a, on my laptop and I looked down and there's all this hair all over the, over the keyboard. Um, and every time I run my hand through my hand, I'm like a molting dog. So it got to a point where I just got to shave it all off. So now, yes, the punk rock look is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. We should add that Stuart is coming at us from where he's actually doing his treatment right now. So Yes, I'm in Surrey, um, which is south of London. Um, I'm receiving treatment at a hospital called the Royal Marsden, uh, which I've gone there because um, it's one of the best centres in the UK for it. And because I pulled strings um, 
and we have a lovely National Health Service here. Um, I've been able to get, get along here. And so yeah, all is going well. I wouldn't recommend it, you know, brain surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy for anybody, but it's not as bad as I feared it was going to be. So I'm still kind of energy levels are okay. I've got my, I've got a bike um, hooked up onto a, a smart trainer in the flat where I am, which means I can, I can cycle and, and link to them online so I can race along uh, with other people around the world, like around Central Park and stuff. So That's incredible. Yeah, it kind of gives me some sanity in amongst, because otherwise your, your life just becomes cancer. All it is, you, you, you lose your hair, you're a cancer patient, you wake up in the morning, take your chemotherapy medicines, you've got to take them at certain times, then you go off to the hospital, have your radiotherapy, and then go back and just try and wait till you feel sick. Um, so it's not fun, but... Not the yeah. most pleasant, yeah, not the most pleasant life for sure. Well, we're very happy to hear you sounding like Stuart. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's incredible, isn't it? I, um, I, th- I think I sent you a picture. I mean, we can share the photo of my brain mm-hmm. after the operation, and it's a huge chunk out of my right frontal lobe. It sure is. And you just look at it and go, "Oh my life! How am I not a complete vegetable? How can I be compus mentis and look at this and still be me?" I'm, I'm feel lucky to be with it. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that initially you had some problems with the the left side of your body. What were those, and how long did they last? Or? It lasted. Um, it started to fade after the first week. So really strange. There's this, there's this phenomenon called uh, neglect or inattention, which sometimes people who have strokes can have. So one side of your visual field, um, you just don't pay attention to at all. And I had this for at least a couple of weeks after the operation. So everything on the left-hand side, I could see it, but I just didn't pay attention to it. So if there was something on my on my hospital table in front of me and it was on the left hand side so let's say I put down a pen or a phone and it was on the left hand side of the table I just wouldn't be able to see it um, my, my vision was absolutely fine my vision is still fine but for just some reason your, your, the perception the pathways that deal with the perception on that side they were, they were damaged at that time and so really strange so I'd be walking along and if there was somebody walking up, like coming my way to the left of me I was um, quite likely just to shoulder barge them just because I like had just lost the perception on that side, really, really strange. People with strokes, when it's when it's really profound, you can put a plate of food in front of them, and they'll only eat one side of the plate of food. Wow! I think that they've eaten the whole plate of food, and you can and so you've got say the left hand side of the plate is still full of food. You spin the plate round. Um, so it's on the so they can see it on the other side, and then when you spin it back again, they'll eat that side of the plate. They eat what's on that side of the plate, the, so they can see it, but they're just not aware of it until it's pointed out to them. Well, so that that first of all is pretty fascinating, but also the fact that I guess the brain just kind of found another way around within a couple of weeks is yeah. incredible too. Yeah, it is kind of it is very incredible. Um, you, new pathways can form because there is a, a significant portion of my brain missing and that has slowly been um, destroyed over time by the tumour. And when it happens very slowly, um, the, the brain sort of finds different pathways around. So it's a little bit like if you've got an underground or uh, an underground kind of train, train network, like say you've got in London or you've got the metro in New York, is that if you've taken out one chunk like so maybe one line um, or a couple of stations aren't working, you can still get all the commuters to work and back. Just the rest of the system has to has to work a lot harder, um, and you have to and like commuters have to find different ways around. And it's exactly the same in the brain. So you lose a bit, and the rest of the brain tries to compensate and finding different ways around to do the same job. The time frame of two weeks, too, right? Like you said, within a couple of weeks, it was sort of things were back to normal. Yeah, it's it was, it's, it's really scary though because I was. I, like not being able to move my hand, it was just like really clumsy, like being a being a child again. And the physiotherapists were brilliant; they got me doing. They just said to me, "Keep exercising, uh, keep working that hand, and it will come back." Because I, I couldn't, I was in tears at one point. I went off to a kitchen to try and make a cup of tea, and I couldn't pick up the the cup with my with my left hand. I had strength, but it was just the coordination. So I could. When I got my hands in a pincer, so my fingers in a pincer, I could grip and I could grab something, but it was just super, super slow. And it's this weird, it's just really, really strange. Um, and I was just really upset because I thought I tried typing and I couldn't type and I couldn't play the guitar and 
and I got like a touch typing sort of piece of software and just basically relearn how to touch type until the, until the movement in the hand came back again. So I think the, you just got to be really belligerent when these sorts of things happen to you. So Stuart, have you been able to get back to writing your book now? Yes. Um, my left hand is working and I can carry on writing book number three, which is uh, it's really, you know, like my passion is doing science communication, science writing. And I think I would have just been just shattered if I couldn't carry on typing. So yeah, book number three is underway. And I was chatting with you guys about some, some, some really interesting stuff that I've been discovering uh, that's well worth having a chat about. Okay, so give us some tidbits from the book for sure. So the book is The Science of Living. That's the working title at the moment. And it's about working through the whole of your day, looking at a scientific skeptical view at all the things that happen to you and all the things that you hear in like the common sort of urban myths and hearsay. You know, for example, things like, should I drink coffee first thing in the morning or should I wait um, should I brush my teeth before or after I've had breakfast? But going into lots and lots of more detailed things. And one of the things that I was looking at is about stress. So, I mean, you guys, if I say to you, what is stress? What would you say? Uh, the feeling of anxiousness over pressure on you to perform. Yeah. I'd say the same thing like when I have to be on in my career. I get quite stressed about that. Even though I love it, it's still very stressful. So you use those words stress, stressed and stressful. So is the situation stressful or are you stressed? Is, is the stress a thing outside of yourself or is the stress something that is happening inside of you? I would say it's something that's happening inside of you. Yes, yeah. exactly. But it's it's very confusing. And if you try and pin down what stress is, uh, it's very it gets very confusing. Um, and we we lump it all together. We say that stress. Um, I'm stressed about exams. I'm stressed about being ill. I'm stressed about a relative having died. I'm, you know, I'm stressed about my relationship. This isn't all true for me at the moment. But um, but you know, we we put everything in this catch-all thing called stress. And the origin of stress, um, before the 1940s, stress was just a word that kind of engineers would use to describe the stresses and strains on like a bridge or something. And in the kind of the, the 1940s, there was a 29-year-old scientist, Hungarian-born guy called Hans Selye. Um, he was working in, uh, in North America and... He had this idea that when he walked past people in hospital, he noticed that they all look sick. And he thought there must be something that's going on with all these people to make them look sick, something that's common amongst all of them. And so he embarked upon a series of pretty grisly, gruesome experiments on rodents. I think they were rats. And he got lots of rats and he put them through all sorts of different kind of tortures he kind of broke some of their legs, he injected them with drugs, he starved some of them, he exercised some of them to exhaustion. And when he'd stressed them, well, he didn't even use the word stress at this point, but when he'd put this, this ordeal on them, he'd sacrificed them after like a couple of days, he'd sacrificed them. And when he looked in, in the body, he saw that the adrenal glands um, had got bigger and the thymus gland, which is a thing that, that, that produces the, the white blood cells, which in a mouse just sits on top of the heart, that had shrunk. So the adrenal glands had got bigger and the, the thymus gland had shrunk. And he said that all, the, all the, the rats had exactly the same thing happen to them. And so he came with this idea of it doesn't matter what the insult that is put on the body, the body responds in the same way with this kind of this blunderbuss um, response. He called it the generalized alarm response, and it, it, it eventually turned, it got coined into this term stress. And so from this, he then developed the idea to say that actually it's not just physical trauma that happens to, he, he, so he said it also happens, it's likely that it happens in humans as well as in animals, that we have this overall global bodily response to something that happens to us. And he deduced that the same thing happens when we go through psychological stresses as when we go through physical stresses, that this whole sort of, there's this hormonal response in your, in your bodily system and that too much of this stress response is harmful for you. That's something that he observed in, in animal experiments. And so then that was his theory and it just essentially caught on. And this guy was, 
I don't think I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating when I say he, he wanted fame. He went around the world touring, spreading this message about stress. He wrote 39 books. Wow. Um, and he, he received Nobel Prize nominations 17 times, but not once did he get it. Man, he was after that prize and he never got it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so he went around preaching this whole thing about stress and, ev- and he kind of, everybody's sort of taken it hook, line and sinker. And here's the, I found this, discovered this really interesting thing. In the 90s, um, there were loads of declassified papers from the tobacco industry when there was a whole kind of legal case going on. And part of the, part of the agreement was that the tobacco industry would kind of open their, their drawers with all their secret files. And in amongst that, found out that in the 1960s, Salier, he was paid um, an annual award of fifty thousand dollars per year to support his research, and in today's terms, that's three hundred and fifty thousand dollars every year. And oddly enough, he testified in court when the tobacco industry was um, being scrutinised for um, cause, essentially for causing lung cancer, and they were fighting back, saying that smoking wasn't wasn't unhealthy he testified in court to say smoking is good for you because it helps relieve stress stress, yeah yeah wow i know and so so stress is dirty little secret and i just thought that's fascinating and actually uh, and when you look at um when you go back and you scrutinize what he did the original experiments the kind of the thymus and the adrenal glands thing they wouldn't be considered a significant change if you actually use proper statistical tests on it like that we would do do now it would just be considered oh it's noise it's just natural variation and so it was all built on this rather shaky foundation and as you go into it you realize that there's actually different types of stress and our body responds to it in different ways so in the same way that if you're going to go on a roller coaster ride your body feels different to if let's say you're going for um i don't know you're moving house or something or you've got a wedding coming up we know it feels different and so there the are actually different, it seems to be that different bodily responses that take place in us. At the moment, they've, they've broken them down to five different types of kind of stresses that are placed on us that cause the body to respond in different ways. So I just think it's really good to actually ask those questions of, you know, it's a common or garden sort of phrase, stress. And we all think that stress is bad for us. And without a doubt, a prolonged sort of bodily response to quote unquote stress leads to lots of problems yet raised cortisol levels which is a, a stress hormone which is detrimental it re- suppresses the immune system and it is detrimental for health in the long term um, but not all stresses are the same and at the time Celia he, he discovered that not all, not all stresses were bad and he tried to group stresses into good stresses and bad stresses but I think it's kind of all rather messy so um, I'm just kind of I just think it's good to think about, actually, when we say everybody's getting more stressed, this is really bad, kids are suffering from exam stress, what actually do we mean? Um, And should we just take everything at face value? And is it tied to sort of the fight or flight response in some some way? Stuart? Yeah, absolutely. He followed on. He just one of uh, a scientist very close to him had just been going into the fight or flight response, and this, so this was off the back of discoveries that were being made at the time about the fight or flight response, which is the body's sort of oh no, I'm going, to, I need to, I need to run away or I need to fight. The whole adrenaline thing that pumps around the body that gets you on edge, and so it kind of follows on from that. The stress response incorporates that um but it's a sort of a longer lasting shift in the body um that's kind of what he was arguing that we have this immediate fight or flight response but when we have any kind of prolonged um sort of threat on us that this whole um, stress response generates with high increased blood pressure cortisol levels going up and lots of bodily changes that take place inside of us but I would, I would urge scepticism on just taking stress at face value. So I just thought that was really, really fascinating. I wasn't expecting to find that at that all. That is fascinating. Yeah. Do you have anything else from your book that you can share with us, Stuart? Um, lots of, yes, yeah, things where market forces and money has got involved with things in surprising ways. So bacon and eggs, for example, they are classic American, I presume it's the same in Canada, breakfast food. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. 
and that came originally from the pork industry was trying to sell more bacon and they managed to lobby doctors around the US to say that a good hearty meal is what a, a working American man deserves and needs to sustain him throughout the day and there's nothing better than um, using bacon and eggs as an example and because they had all these doctors endorsements of a hearty breakfast such as bacon and eggs it became this part of american breakfast culture and in a similar way orange juice or i know we just call it orange juice but i think breakfast juice is the kind of the the general or garden kind of um term for it that was by Californian growers, I think it was in the 19, uh, 1920s, 1930s, they had a glut of oranges that, were, that they tried to get rid of, and the Growers Group Association came up with this idea of let's turn it into juice because you know you get hardly any juice from oranges, so you can sell lots of oranges for that, and market it as a health drink. And you can go back and find um, nearly 100-year-old health healthy eating leaflets produced by sunkist about how orange juice neutralizes the harmful acids in your body and helps keep you well so this whole kind of acid alkali thing that we think is modern um they were doing it they were doing it about 100 years ago and trying to flog um orange juice off the back of it while we wait in anticipation for your new book i just want to remind listeners that you have a couple of awesome books out science of cooking science of spice or spice depending on where you are that was a lovely message on twitter Stuart, from that one person that had just discovered your spice book you're not on a retainer for um for saying nice things about my book um <laughs> no i love your we have your books <laughs> we, and i we love on them, them. <laughs> yeah i mean again the the anybody the author's dream is for people to buy their book and to read it and enjoy it and and getting really lovely um heartfelt feedback from people who say love your book it's actually changed the way i do things Mm -hmm. it's just like you know that's that's exactly why i write a book um so it's amazing it's just you know humbling when when what you do can has like a positive impact on on people's lives so yeah absolutely delighted that crow in the background can curse (laughs) yeah (laughs) well well i am in um in in the glorious outdoors here yeah so since we have you on, I have to ask you a food question, if that's Whoa. okay. I have one too, actually. Yeah, absolutely. I came across this article, it was a BBC article, um, and I had it bookmarked for a while, but there's no way I'm taking on a food myth on our show and we have access to you. Is reheated pasta less fattening? And I, I read this has to do with uh, the structure changes. It becomes resistant starch. So do you know anything about that, Stuart? Yeah, it's true. We think of starch as being just one and the same thing or you look at carbohydrates on the back of on the back of a packet and and the assumption has been that a calorie is a calorie is a calorie which is true um but your body can process some foods better than others so in the same way that you have a really ripe pear that's really soft and juicy and tastes really sweet the starches in that have been turned uh, more starch has been turned into sugars and so that causes your blood glucose levels to spike a lot more than if you have an unripe pear which is which is really hard and there's not and it doesn't taste very sweet there's not a lot of sugars in it but you were to look at the, at the calories on it and it would say that they were exactly the same but so your body deals with starches in a different way depending on how easy it is for the body to break it down and this interesting thing is that when you have they've done this with pasta and surprisingly if you have pasta that's cold it's harder for the body to break down and extract the calories from than pasta that is hot and i don't know exactly why that is but but that is the case there seems to be something that happens as it warms up presumably something on a, on a chemical level that makes the the starches the the bonds between the starches looser and so the the enzymes in your gut can can break them apart and break them into sugars more easily um so yeah that's a handy little tip isn't it interesting so Stuart, i have a question for you and this really surprised me i read somewhere that and i'm sure many many people do this you shouldn't reheat rice ever you shouldn't keep it So, yeah, if you don't take anything else away, if you never, ever reheat rice, you'll be perfectly safe. Uh, But there is a danger from reheating rice, but it doesn't mean that you can't ever do it. The reason why reheated rice can be dangerous sometimes is that 
on the surface of rice, sometimes there is a bug uh, that comes from the soil called Bacillus cereus. The problem is that some of the toxins it can produce will withstand high temperatures. Um, and so if you've had rice that's been cooked, that cooked rice is safe because any bacteria that were on it were killed when you cooked it. But if then you, um, you let it cool, those bacteria can form spores and those spores that may have survived the heating process, they can kind of hatch. The spores are like little eggs. They'll hatch and start producing their, their toxins again. If, say, you let it cool down to room temperature and leave it on the side, just don't either eat it quickly. Don't just leave it there all day. Otherwise, you're just helping those, those, those bacteria that have turned into, into hardy spores that have survived the cooking process. They'll hatch and start producing toxins. And the longer that you leave it there, the more they'll produce. And these substances, they cause either vomiting or diarrhea, depending on which toxin it is that survives. So you can cook it again. And these toxins um, are heat resistant. So even if you, even when you cook it again, you kill the remaining bacteria, the toxins will still be in it. So when you eat it, it will make you really sick. If you cook it, then cool it down as quickly as possible and put it in the fridge. If you then want to cook it again in 24 hours, then do it. But more than about a day, um, either eat it cold or chuck it away. After 48 hours, make sure you just bin it because then it wouldn't be safe. 24 hours you can cook it. After that, eat it cold. After 48 hours, throw it away. Wow, I'm sure that a lot of people do not know that. Yeah, and I wonder if that's going to trigger some memories in people who have eaten rice a couple of days after and kind of felt a little sickly. Well, what we call Chinese food often comes with rice, and, and I, I know all, my whole life that, that oh, yeah. I'd keep that in the fridge for a week and keep eating yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Hmm, You've got to you be careful. But, I mean, if you're into, into cooking, then actually... If you're going to do fried rice, it's much nicer and it's much tastier, easier to cook if you let it cool. For the same sort of reason why cooled pasta um, isn't processed by the body as easily. When you cool starches, um, this thing called retrogradation happens uh, where the, um, the, the starches that have been cooked, which are form, which become soft and jelly-like, which is why um, rice becomes soft and you can eat it but from its hard state, is that when it cools, those starches start to go back into their hard state again. As it goes harder, the, the individual grains can separate more easily. So when you put it in a wok and you fry it, um, or you can keep all the grains separate and you get much nicer, nicer fried rice because every single grain can get coated with the nice flavours from your wok. Interesting. Stu, before we let you go, is there anything else you wanted to mention? With the treatment that I'm having at the moment, half of people who have the treatment that I'm having with the type of tumour that I have make it to five years. So that means, broadly, life expectancy of about five years. There's a lot of variation in that, and we don't know uh, what's going to happen with me. So um, as a scientist and as somebody who isn't up for dying um, in my 40s, um, decided that I wanted to do everything that I can. That is scientifically based. Um, all the, you know, I'm not into going off and having crazy sort of acupuncture treatments and things that clearly don't work. But is there anything I can do to increase my odds to get me down the survival curve so that I'm I'm, I'm making it maybe ten plus years? Because there are always people who who are long term survivors who defy the odds with brain tumours, there are, there are always there's about 1% or 2% of people that just keep on living. And we don't know exactly why that happens. And from kind of research, I came across a chap called Ben Williams, who is a Harvard, he was a Harvard professor, not in kind of medical stuff, actually, in sort of, I think it was psychology. And he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is a more a grade four tumour, brain tumour, which is a more aggressive cancer than the one I have. I've got a grade three presently. And when you've got, when you're diagnosed with that, he was diagnosed back in 95, um, essentially sort of 12, 18 months tops um, he was given and he sort of was one of these stubborn people who refused to accept 
what he was told and was was insistent that there was something else something more that could be done so he went we're in pre-internet era he went away dug out all the journals and found everything that he possibly could and educated himself on brain tumors and essentially found obscure um research that had been done on rats on brain tumors and all over anything that he could find that had possible evidence that could help uh, his chemotherapy and his radiotherapy fight the cancer so he wasn't on about i'm going to abandon conventional treatment because you know radiotherapy and chemotherapy works it's evidence-based we know that it works but he was interested in what can i do to make that better and so he essentially ended up taking a cocktail of supplements and repurposed drugs which means there's many drugs that we take that are approved that seem to have some anti-cancer effects so the anti-malarial drug chloroquine for example um, it's, it fights malaria, it fights the bug that causes malaria, but it also seems to have an effect with cancers and it makes, can- it makes it more difficult for cancer cells to grow. So you add that one into the mix. So he add that and then he found that there's some mushroom extract that's been used in the Far East for cancers and stuff and there was some evidence for that. So he took that and added that in and just kept adding supplements and supplements and drugs and drugs and drugs to take on top to kind of concoct his own... I can call it a cocktail or a multi-drug therapy that that is just kind of a homemade multi-drug therapy. And you, you can't, it's, an, it's one anecdote, but he's still alive and he published he, he published the book and he updates it fairly often. Actually, I think he's retired. And there's another guy who updates it with all the latest research of all poss- you know, it's freely available online. Um, if, you, if you Google um, surviving terminal cancer, you'll find a website that there's a little document, well, there's, it's about a 90-minute documentary that goes through all and explains it all. And you can also get a book that goes with that. And the most up-to-date version is available online that you can just download it. And it goes and it updates every couple of years. as So these are all the things that might help. This is the evidence behind it. Um, these are the potential risks. Uh, this is kind of a real deep dive stuff that, that, that he's doing and that the person who's taken over is is doing. Um, and yeah, and so I've adopted this approach and I, and I know that it's, I can't guarantee it's going to help at all. And that none of these things are randomized controlled trial. We don't know which of them work, but I'm of the, of the mentality of try everything. And if it works, then you're, then you've won. Or, you know, if you, you there's, there's nothing to lose essentially. The, the risk is that, um, it can interact with some of the treatments that I'm getting and potentially could make things worse. But for that reason, you're picking things that have been tested already for which there is a sensible rationale for it. Um, and so I've got a huge box of, uh, so I'm taking the chloroquine on top of all the other chemotherapy and the radiotherapy and everything else and lots of other things. Like there's really good research for very high dose of vitamin D. Um, there are some long term, there's some studies. I mean, there's only small studies. There are only kind of like nine or ten people in, in each of these studies. But the thing is, is that there's no funding for repurposed drugs and for supplements um, because there isn't the kind of the financial incentive. Because nobody's going to make a load of money out of, um, out of chloroquine, for example, using, using anti-malarial for cancer. So the, the philosophy is much like HIV, one drug isn't going to kill cancer. We know that one chemotherapy won't kill cancer. Um, if you attack it with lots of different things, then there is, a, there is, there is hope that you can essentially carpet bomb your cancer um, and increase so that you live long and prosper. Is your oncologist in support of this? Well, this is the interesting thing is I was really disappointed because I went, I, you know, I, I, he'd, he'd heard of Ben Williams and he knows about the whole thing behind it, but he's just really skeptical and has to toe the party line of, look, we don't know if these things help or hinder. They're, they've not been through randomized controlled trials. Um, these are only small studies. We don't know exactly what kind of tumor Ben Williams actually had. He, and he's a, you know, N of one, he's only one person. Um, and, I'm kind of of the mindset, yes, those are all provisos. I think it, he he almost certainly did have a glioblastoma that is in long-term remission. But it's a case of, I think, let people go for stuff, that, that record what they're taking, and if it works, then after the fact, work out what was it that was working. Don't deny people the chance of taking something. Really good movie, if you ever watch Lorenzo's Oil, 
movie back in the 80s. Have you seen it? Wow, long time ago, but I don't really remember. Oh, uh, it's a great movie. It's about parents who try to create a cure for their son who has this horrible neurodegenerative condition. And they come up against, I watched it fairly recently because it just been on my mind. And, they, and this is based, this is about 30 odd years ago, this movie, uh, based on a true story. And it, descri- it shows you all the opposition that they came up against with, with the doctors saying, no, look, we can't do this. It's not based on a study. We can't try this. Even though they're saying, look, we have, um, we want to try this. There is some, you know, there's, there's science behind it. That we think it's going to work. Let's give it a go. And they're saying, no, it might be dangerous. It might be dangerous. And the same mentality, unfortunately, is around today that there's, a, I'm ashamed because I'm a, you know, of the medical establishment myself. And it's disappointing that there's still this kind of very, very closed minded, there's a fear almost of being prepared to say, um, try stuff that that's somehow going to endorse crazy uh, alternative therapies actually i'm not saying that at all so it's a i mean i'd be really interested if um listeners had an opinion on this um because um you know it is kind of controversial and you know as you know my myself this part of me thinking actually am i just sort of you know abandoning science and skepticism in favor of sort of a vain hope on balance, I don't think I am, but I would be interested to see what other people made of it. So, yeah, as I say, there is that um, documentary, Surviving Terminal Cancer. I think it's survivingterminalcancer.com and you can watch it. It's about yeah, 90 minutes long. It's quite heavy, uh, but it's very interesting if you're, if you're remotely interested in, in these sorts of things, in medical stuff or in cancer. If you have terminal cancer, anything reasonable that can make you feel like you're in control is probably a good thing psychologically. Yeah, I'm ha- I'll take the placebo, thank you very much. I'm quite happy with that. Yeah. I, I guess the, the real concern, at least from your oncologist, is this going to hinder what we're trying to do yeah, already? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Which is why, I mean, I can't, you know, which is why nobody can really endorse it because these are, I mean, say they're untested. They, they are untested. But when you look, so, but say, for example, the, um, the anti-malarial, uh, we know that people who have been taking anti-malarials whilst, uh, and been having brain tumor treatments do better than those who aren't taking anti-malarials. So it's not completely blind. But yeah, absolutely, you've got to be really careful about sort of... So yeah, if I was in his shoes, I would... I don't know what I would do. I'd, I'd like to think I'd be a little bit more kind of open-minded of, okay, let's discuss these things. Let's, let's keep a record of what you're taking so we can keep a track on what your blood results are doing and everything. And if he were in your shoes, he may be a uh, way more open-minded. Exactly. When I've, when I've come across this opposition, um, there was one guy who's, who was, was quite um, anti. He said, um, well, if you choose to go against medical advice, then I can't stop you. And I, and I said to him, listen, if you were in my shoes, I think you'd be doing exactly the same thing. And oddly enough, he sort of, he kind of took that on board. So I think it is true when it, it's different when the shoe's on the other foot. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm. Stuart, you sound like the old Stuart. You're back to writing. I'm, I'm really happy for you that, that things are going as well as they possibly can, it seems? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm, uh, you know, I, I think, not bigging myself up, I think that it is going well. Um, I've not suffered with the with the fatigue from the radiotherapy that uh, people said that I would. Um, I've managed to get on top with it, with the nausea, with the chemotherapy. So, um, yeah, and, and I thank you guys for, for your kind of concern and support. It, it means a lot. And also the kind of where, where listeners have have sent me kind messages. Although, you know, like I'm never going to see these people. Hopefully I'll, I'll come across and meet you guys some, at some point. Um, it just, it just, it's just nice. It gives you a boost, gives you a lift, and it does help. And a lot of it is all in your head. A lot of the battle is in your head. So, yeah, thank you. Did you enjoy your gentleman's relish? I, just, I was just going <laughs> to apologize for the gentleman's relish. Yeah, it's, um, it's very, very fishy. Mm. Man, it's like... Um, yeah, it's like anchovies plus plus plus. Um, you've got to have it really, really sparingly, otherwise you're just overwhelmed by fishness. Um, it's nice. I'm really pleased I've got it. It's it's great, it did, and it did. It really did make me smile. It was I was really touched by it. Thank you. 
Oh, it, it was more of a joke than anything because I remember when we had you on, we played a game, and and you said I've never tried it. Yeah, and yeah. So Christina and, f- and I were talking. We were like, we have to send him some gentleman's yeah. relish. It was just fun, um, a fun way to let you know that we were thinking about you and care about you. So thanks, thank you, thank you. Really, really. So Stuart, it. keep us posted as as things progress, and do. Uh, do keep us posted on the book. What's the when do you figure the release will be? Um, I'm hoping to have it all finished in the next month, all being well, and then we'll be looking for, and it'll take ages to actually get it all together because it's got to be artworked and made beautiful and go backwards and forwards for various edits and proofing and testing. And um, sometime in 2020, we're probably looking at the middle of 2020 now, by the way things are going. So next year, we should have, we should have some more reading for you guys and, and for everybody else. So, yeah. Great. Awesome. If you're feeling up to it, uh, let us know and we'll have you back on the show. I know this is a little bit dicey because of the, the time. Um, that's why we're doing this during the day, this particular discussion. But if you're uh, feeling up to it and you can stay up late enough, by all means, uh, give us a shout and we'll, uh, we'll have you back on the show yes. with the full crew. We yeah, also have to. another Dr. Stewart that has some questions yep. for Stuart you. Stuart Robbins, he's a yeah. He's military scientist. Yeah. He loves food. Uh, Stu Robbins is a, is, a, is a big foodie, and he actually was saying that he would love to interview you, so maybe we can hook that up when you're feeling up to it. Oh, that'd be great. Two, two guests together. That'd be a... Yeah, yeah. the two Stu's finally. Two Stu's. Two Stu's. That'd be the great. The fifth the two, beetle the and, the other, and the sixth beetle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Stuart, really nice to catch up with you. Do take care and, and likewise, uh, keep in touch. Likewise, Thank you. Yeah, oh, and, um, oh yeah, I was just going to say about the, uh, the, the book. Um, I've had uh, the sales now from the science of cooking has we've sold um 150,000 just over wow. and about 50, and about 50,000 of the um of the spice book as well so really pleased with that really just That's incredible yeah I, I, congratulations yeah, thank you well deserved thank you thank you thank you friends for show notes or to discuss this episode visit our facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com for general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion email info at trcpodcast.com Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast.